Hi. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, free webinar entitled The Future of Inkjet Printheads. That's what we would like to talk to you uh, about today. Now, if ink <clears throat> is the blood of your printer, then I think we can all agree that a printhead is the heart of your printer. And thus, it's a very important part. And I'm sure that most of you know how printheads worked in the past 10 to 20 years. And most of you, including me, really don't have a clue where this technology is going to go in the next five to 10 years. And that's why we're very happy to have uh, Richard Darling uh, from SAR here with us today, who's gonna give us a little insight uh, on where um, this technology, printhead, inkjet printhead technology will uh, be evolving in the next uh, five to 10 years. So I'm quite happy to uh, hand over um, the words to Richard Darling and um, he'll give you uh, a nice presentation and a lot of um, details on, on, on this subject. Okay, so Richard, over to you. Thank you, Philip. Um, I'm happy to do this presentation. Uh, I, I'm not sure, it's, it's a slightly unusual situation in that um, Zara is, is way behind the scenes for most of, most of the, uh, the audience, I'm guessing, in that we, uh, we actually deal with um, uh, original equipment manufacturers and sometimes that's that we provide actually take some years if months or years before they actually find their way into printers so the technology track that we're on um, actually manifests itself in in product that's available for for the graphics market sometime down the line but what I'll do is I'll take you through I know it's future inkjet uh, printhead technology but I'm going to take you through some of the past so that there's a background for it and then I'm going to take you into some of the things that we're doing now and how some of those things now will actually come into the realm of graphics products, graphic printer products, um, over the coming months and years. Um, I, I, there are limitations as to what I can say um, about how what we're introducing, the specifics, the science, the technology, and the, um, and the mechanics of it all. But um, uh, I hope you'll appreciate that. But uh, when, when, it, when, it, when the final package arrives, it's, it's a package of all those things inside it, and, um, and, and it is um, intellectual property. So we have to be careful before a product actually reaches the market. Um, the background to Zar, um, I certainly, I've, I've been in wide format graphics for a long time, but um, my, my contact with Zar was sort of very, very distant. I knew the name, but nothing more. So just to make sure that uh, people know who Zar is, if that should be interesting. We were founded in about 1990 as a spin-out from Cambridge Consultants. Cambridge Consultants take technology from the university and spin it out into companies that can commercialize that technology. Um, Zar's IP at that time was piezo-based inkjet technology, um, primarily aimed at um, industrial printing or, or deposition processes. Uh, but uh, the, the, the task for Zar was to actually find a way of taking that to market to make it useful. By the mid-1990s, the main business model was to license the technology to people who could manufacture and use the technology in products. So licenses were sold to IBM, Brother, Toshiba, Minato, Seiko, Panasonic, and a range of others. Um, and, and at that stage, that was, that was because it takes cash to manufacture this type of product. That was the route to mark for us. And um, it, it, to be honest, it was disappointing because the take up in the market, when you've got a new technology, it depends on people actually showing faith in it and pushing it. So it wasn't, it wasn't happening as fast as it should have. So by the approaching the end of the 90s, then the, the strategy was then to move into manufacturing, uh, raising the cash through an IPO in 97, and then um, uh, purchasing the IBM plant in Sweden uh, were the way, ways into that. So, so that's where, where Zar started as a manufacturer of print heads. Now our technology is developed to be sold in component form. So we sell print heads which embody all of our technology. Some of those licenses continue for technology, individual parts of technology. So most of the printers in the graphics market, or many of them certainly, um, with print heads in from our partners, um, our, our licensee partners, um, they actually include some Zar technology. But um, the strategy for some years has been that all of our technology is only available in Zar products. 
So we design, we research behind it, design, manufacture, and sell print heads um, as, as our core business. We are the largest independent supplier of, in, of, of industrial piezo print heads, um, and we deal, as I said before, with OEMs all around the world, OEMs that produce digital printing products. 93% of what we produce in the UK and in Sweden is exported. Um, we've grown by about 60% over the last two years, and we now have um, over 830 staff. That's purely focused on research and development and uh, manufacture and, and distribution sales and administration for the print heads. Um, more now is being invested in R&D because we've had a very healthy period of the last three or four years, growing uh, massively. So uh, the investment in R&D to get to the next stage has been phenomenal. 12% of what we, what we earn, what we take in, is reinvested in R&D. Um, we have a very large R&D facility in Cambridge, and, um, uh, and that's coming through with some technologies and products which, uh, which, which will help to change the way things are in the graphics market, amongst other markets. So going back a little, uh, the, first, the first conversion in the market to inkjet was graphics back in 2000. So that's a mature um, uh, transformation from traditional processes to inkjet. The next stage was to develop something that could print single pass. And that's not something that's, that's really into the graphics market at the moment. Um, we created a plant for the single pass um, uh, products um, in Huntingdon. Um, that was our second plant. Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, the, the next major digital conversion took place or started. Uh, and that continues to this day. And there are others that are overlapping it as well. But that was uh, ceramic tile printing. Uh, and, and, and that's interesting. I'll go, go into more detail in that later. Um, at that period, because of that wave of, of uh, adoption of, uh, of inkjet, our plant was, uh, was expanded with very large investment and some very specialist equipment to, to manufacture, um, all on long lead times. But we've been expanding ever since to, uh, for year-on-year -year doubling of output and, um, and turnover. So uh, the wave of conversion to, uh, in an industry is, is difficult to cope with. Um, but we've, we've actually managed to cope with that, and we're looking for others now. Now, some of the things we've learned in that uh, are bringing technologies that will fold back into um, wide and grand format graphics. Our manufacturing plants there, you can see pictures. I'll flick through that very quickly. The headquarters in Cambridge, we have three buildings on the Science Park in Cambridge. Um, we have a manufacturing plant in Stockholm, Sweden. That was the original one. That's where some of the older products are made, and all of the newer products are actually made in Huntingdon. So new technology is introduced through the manufacturing at Huntingdon in the UK. The way that we look at the market, Three real main sectors. Graphic arts, which is where printing is to advertise a product or to message about a product. That's, that's where the wide format graphics uh, area sits in our classification. Packaging, um, which is where a, a product is printed. So uh, you actually um, you print on something that actually, like it could be a bottle or a case or something. So you've got labeling, direct to shape, which is printing directly onto a container and coding and marking, which is the statutory information for date coding. That's a, a significant part of our business, too. And then, the, lastly, the industrial, but not least, the industrial sector, which is the largest of our sectors, which is actually printing a product. It's making a product. So that could be decorating a ceramic tile. So you'll have seen over the last few years, if you've uh, taken an interest in ceramic tiles, that the, uh, the, the variety of design that's available and the uh, the, the move away from repeated patterns um, has been incredible been a revolution in that sector. Now, the same could happen in wood-based products. So for things like office furniture, where all of the grain is the same, that, that may change over coming years. Now, that, that's, that's down to some of the technologies that we've introduced and some of the technologies that are interested for wide format, well, interesting format graphics. Um, we're, we are also into the uh, things that are in the press now, advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, printing photovoltaics. All of that is made possible by the types of technology that we're bringing in. And as they become uh, commercialized and more uh, produced in volume, then some of those things can come into graphic arts. So in wide format graphics, you see there, I'm just going to flick through this. At the bottom chart, there we do an analysis on each sector. In this, it is a mature sector, and there is a large digital contingent. Um, there is still 
a lot of a lot of um, material is actually printed um, by analog, but that will diminish, and the the inkjet produced uh, production the output from printers will increase dramatically. Now that's going to mean uh, change in a variety of ways. It's going to mean uh, high volume printers. It's going to be perhaps single pass. It's going to mean more multi pass printers, and it's um, the way that the industry is structured that we can't tell. But all we can tell from a variety of sources over the next few years, there will be a, a doubling at least of inkjet printed output from wide format graphics inkjet. Let's, uh, that's the platform for this discussion, but let's move into some of the other sectors. We look at ceramics, and you can see there, that's the type of thing that does happen when you get a, a, a revolution for digital. Um, there's now very little um, analog production, and there's certainly no sale of analog printers because the, the inkjet devices are more reliable, they're more productive, they're more cost effective, and running them is more cost effective, plus they give design variety. So nobody, as, as one ceramic tile manufacturer said, nobody in their right mind would buy an analog machine. Uh, we move into decorative laminates. That's um, in its infancy at the moment. It's only just started. There's something like 30 installations out of 1,600 worldwide. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a flavor in a second about the type of installation that is. But that's also expected to similarly, it's competing for the same space of decorated interior materials. Again, it needs those reliable technologies that uh, allow single pass production in a, a relentless, uninterrupted uptime. So looking at uh, what, what, what technology is getting more into the product now, um, there's a print bar. This, was taken, this photograph was taken two weeks ago at the imprint exhibition in Hanover that some of you may have, um, may have visited. Um, it's a, it's a 2.1 meter print bar um, with ZAR 1002 print heads um, that is capable of printing. There are eight of those bars in a machine. This one, the, 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 uh, the exhibition's um, product innovation of the show um, award. Now this, this, is, this print bar is, is, is in a, a number of print bars. I think there are four or eight on a system. Um, it, in, in that type of system, it's capable of producing something like 8,000 meters per hour with photographic quality in a full color process. Um, so it's, it's a high resolution, a high output, high productivity, ultra reliable print bar. And, and it's not just a new product invitation, innovation. It's actually in a printer. There's, a, there's, there's one of these printers actually installed at a customer in Germany. The, the little red circle actually shows the scale. That's, that's actually the operator. So, so this machine is capable of taking um, it's decorating wood-based boards at that kind of rate on a three-shift system. And, and the challenge there for the technology, for inkjet technology, is to make sure that that's, um, all of those print heads in all of those bars are jetting correctly um, with, with no downtime. Now, that's relevant for wide format graphics because if that sort of reliability can be folded back into a, a graphics application, that means that uh, I'm sure that many wide format graphics printers have worked, worked very hard, but there is an, el an element of downtime from things like cleaning cycles and, and from when things go wrong. Um, so what, what, our, what our technology is aiming to do is to, is to bring reliability, print head life, expectancy, um, and all of those things to a new level so that uh, inkjet uh, is considered to be a reliable production technology rather than um, in some cases where it's actually been quite temperamental. Another example, um, printing directly onto containers. I mean, many of you may have seen the Share a Coat campaign last year. Now, we're not saying that that was actually produced on, um, on inkjet devices. Some of it was, um, but it was, uh, that was a challenge for that brand to, to, to get the capacity. Now, this is because they knew that things were coming to be able to produce between, let's say, 36,000 bottles an hour as a typical um, that's 36,000 bottles of beverage, whatever flavor or, or whether it's alcoholic, non-alcoholic. These are lines around the world. There are something in the order of uh, 15,000 of these lines around the world. And we're talking about equipment that can, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a still photograph that's deliberately showing vagueness around the print heads. But those heads are, are spinning around containers to, to decorate those containers in a line that, with that output. Now these are phenomenal speeds, and you can imagine that if anything goes wrong on a machine like that, that stops the line, 
and that is disastrous. So it's not, that's not allowed. It's not even a possibility. So again, reliability is the thing for this, and um, a robust print head is absolutely essential. Um, so in all of that, there's some examples of industrial requirements. Single pass operation, yes, so you can produce an, uh, an image single pass. Now in graphics, that may, that may not be possible because you've got a mechanical system that has to position the print head to within about uh, five microns uh, of another, uh, another pass. So you've got all of the expansion, contraction, and mechanical tolerances that go into sweeping across in, in multi-pass operation. But single pass operation from a print head's perspective is now proven and, uh, and common. Most of our output is single pass. Um, precision of drop, drop placement. Of course, you need to have precise drops. And the next point, uniformity of drop mass and velocity. That all relates to positioning uniform dots, dots of predictable sizes of the required sizes in the right position with extreme accuracy. Now, all of that, from a print head's perspective, is possible. Um, it's, it's regular. It's our normal business. Now, some of that in industrial applications is far more precise than it is in a wide format graphics environment. And, and some of that is to do with actually running the print head at speeds that are within its stated um, window, operating window, not running it flat out. So it, many of the wide format graphics market uh, um, offerings are actually quoted at uh, frequencies that are, let's say, at the ragged edge. So you lose some of that um, uniformity because you're trying to run fast, and you're trying to run fast because printer, printer manufacturers are actually chasing speed and spec on spec sheets because that's what sells printers. But from a user's perspective, um, I, I guess this is a little bit of a tortoise and hare. Um, that's an extreme illustration, but uh, it's not always fast is better. You also need the reliability, as I've said, for continuous production. Downtime costs money, it's inconvenient, and it causes uh, uh, knock-on effects, so you don't want that either as, uh, as a bottleneck for input or output. Um, long life print expectancy for a print head is absolutely essential. Robustness goes along with that. It doesn't matter if it fails, but you've got to know when it's going to fail. So that's the focus of our technology, is to try and make it so that it will last a defined period of time. Um, it, will, it, it may last longer, but you're not going to ex 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 accept, uh, expect failures within that time, um, because reacting to Unpredicted failure is expensive, and planned maintenance is much less costly. Um, now we, what we're doing is we're, we're actually taking, taking this from the industrial environment to put it into to graphics. So I'll explain a little. We started off with graphics. Our, our first platform one products uh, back in the 90s, they, they are still, still sold into machines. They're still sold, sold as spare parts. They're still available through DigiPrint Supplies for a number of the OEM machines uh, in the market. Um, they are still fitted into um, new machines in various parts of the world. Platform 2 was introducing Grayscale, and that was really developments that were with um, specific manufacturers. We, we're phasing that out because simply those products don't stand up to comparison with the Platform 3 products. So Platform 3 is our main focus here. Um, for development. We've, our main products have been 1001, and now we've moved to 1002. We do that in three drop sizes, um, 6 picoliter, uh, 12 picoliter, and there's a 1 picoliter, um, which is rather more specialist. Um, that's, that's where we've been so far. There are more products coming. So th that gives the, the path. We're looking at the top end of that, um, that diagram. Platform 3 is where we are, 2007 to, 2000 to, to now. From now to 2016, there's another platform which you can see there is, is, uh, is a completely different platform. It moves from bulk piezo to thin film piezo. I'll explain more later. Um, our technology has been based on shear mode um, and uh, chevron actuation, uh, which is where you, you actually put two pieces of lead zirconium titanate together with opposite polarity. And then you, you're, you're creating a, 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 uh, an acoustic wave in each uh, chamber. Um, by an energy pulse, an electric, uh, electrical energy pulse. Now, our technology is generally um, proven to be low stress, uh, low energy environment. So you actually get more movement of your fluid for less energy input. That means that the print head is less stressed, so it should last longer. And it means that you're generating less heat in the process, which can have many effects from cooling the machine down 
to making sure it's operating within safe parameters, not self safe from a health and safety, but safe for the equipment system. Um, and, and, it, and it means that uh, you're actually consuming less power. Um, variable drop size, we, we, on, the, on the 1002 products, we're grayscale eight, uh, level, eight levels from, from zero to seven DPD. Um, that gives effects of creating high resolution with lower native res resolution. So we're, we're at 360 native resolution, and we can create 1080 um, apparent resolution. And the last part of that technology is the main thing that makes the industrial reliability. And, th and that's, that's what may be interested for the immediate future. TF technology is recirculating in past the back of the nozzles. But the back of the nozzles, not in a chamber, an antechamber behind the chambers, the, the jetting chambers. It's actually right behind the nozzle. So what that does is it keeps the ink fresh at that point. It manages the ink condition at the point of jetting. So, our technology is a combination of grayscale and, um, and, and actuation technology and TF technology to, to, to manage the condition of fluids. Um, that really repeats what I've said. It, it does, the TF actually, it dramatically improves the reliability and so much so that there, there are, you know, it's accepted as the industrial norm that recy recirculation is, is a must for anything where uptime is, is, is critical. Now, that, that leads to the position of why not use it in other sectors. Um, so before we go into that and, and the next products that are coming along down the track, the technology track is to look at um, how ejection of a drop, and this is, this is where we get into physics and chemistry really, ejection of a drop, um, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to say how, but we, when you eject a drop, you actually put a charge on it. That can depend on how you drive that drop through. Um, we don't operate a pump, we operate an acoustic pressure wave which ejects the drop. So it imparts energy to the fluid, which is ejected through the nozzle. As that leaves the nozzle, it can actually have a charge. And depending on the charge of the substrate, and you may have noticed effects where you, you actually get different effects on different substrates, that can be from uh, compatibility of charge. So you may, on some substrates, you may have to maintain your print, uh, clean the print heads more regularly. That's all to do with drop charging. So we're, we're looking at ways of managing that charge, managing the charge of the drop that's ejected from the print head, and then uh, it would be for the OEM to, to manage the charge on substrates. That gives improved reliability, uh, longer time between cleaning cycles, if cleaning cycles are necessary at all. We are actually in the realms of running something in the order of 3,000 meters before any intervention is necessary, and that's just a, a vacuum wipe from the print head. So with some of our OEM um, OEMs, they're, they're able to achieve 3,000 meters continuous printing before there's an intervention, which I think is rather more than the standard for, for wide format graphics. The next thing we're looking at is passivation improvements. Inside the print head, there is an electrode that, uh, to, on each chain, cha uh, chamber, each channel wall, which is to, to, uh, to, to, to actually transmit the energy into the chamber wall. So it's an electrical contact, and that has to be protected by passivation. Uh, often when a head blows, then that's because that passivation fails. Um, it can be uh, compromised by various things, fluids particularly. So you might get a head to last a certain amount of time, but if, if we don't understand the chemistry, the fluid can actually damage the print head passivation. So we're looking at ways to improve the passivation, to make it thinner, more effective, um, with basically it's nano coatings and atomic layer deposition. So the research that we're doing goes into that. Um, in our process control, the next section, color balancing, people want heads to drop into place where they don't need to be trimmed and adjusted. They actually perform as the head before it did, but without whatever failure, failure there is. To build machines or to repair machines, that's essential. And to get uniformity of imaging, um, the uniformity of drop mass, drop velocity, and, um, and print head performance um, has to be regular across the print head. There are imperceptible changes in the way that we make print heads to generate that. Uh, so 1002 compared to 1001 has many of those things included. So that improved uniformity helps people to build machines and helps people to main, maintain machines, which should mean, to, uh, mean that, that uh, the capital cost of machines comes down and the running cost of machines comes down. So the next product we're introducing is something that takes some of those technologies and it puts it into a package which we think um, is, is, is performant graphics. 
this will start to um, start to see its way into printers over the next months and years. Um, it's from single pass, but it's for multi pass. So it has the um, it's, it's it's a cost effective package. It's robust. It's suitable for UV solvent, and eco solvent inks. Um, it will later become available for water-based inks and for hybrid inks, for like hybrid UV and uh, and latex. Uh, so we'll start to see this in machines where it offers options for fluid types. It's 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 what's called an edge shooter architecture, and I will explain more about that just in a moment. Um, it gives stability, the flexibility of ink supply options where you can use through flow technology, recirculation technology, or you may not, um, and that's. That's for the OEM to decide how they configure a machine, but it gives options there, um, and and it's designed to give a, a reliable productivity so that it can uh, it can provide some of the things that are necessary in single pass industrial print in the wide format graphic scanning environment. You can have, as I said, you've got options for the for the ink supply. You can either have it recirculating continuously. Um, as the print head scans and prints, um, it, you get a constant rate of recirculation so that it's continuously priming behind the nozzles, cleaning the ink, making sure there are no air bubbles, air ingestions, and recovering from any lineouts. Um, you, can, you can use that, but that means a, a more complex ink supply system with pressure management and thermal management, which may make a machine more costly. But the upside is it gives the ultimate reliability. Then you can use it just as a, the third option. There is you can use it as a single, as a simple, like a, a most of the other print heads in the market, um, which is where you actually have a, a ink supplied to the jetting chamber, and that's where it stays until it's used. It's a very simple gravity-fed ink supply system, and it's the it should be a low capital cost, but you may find uh, the traditional sort of reliability issues where you have to put it through cleaning cycles and purges and primes. Intermediate, you can actually have it switched recirculation. So you can have a simple recirculating system, a pump and a timer, so that it can pulse through at the end, end of traverse. So effectively, you're going through an internal cleaning operation at the end of each pass. And that, that delivers uh, recovery. So you don't have a line up multi-pass. You don't lose a print. You don't have to stop. Um, and and uh, that's going to increase productivity and reduce wastage. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a, it's a low-cost ink supply system to deliver a, a, a step change in reliability. So I said I'd explain more. That's, that's a traditional, this is just a diagram that shows the ink goes to a chamber, it's a, va a manifold, and it's available in the chambers and, and, and supplied to the chambers ready for jetting. So as soon as you actually trigger jetting, you jet and it's replenished. That's very simple. Ink recirculation. Uh, through flow is you take it into one manifold across through the channels behind the nozzle into another manifold and back out continuously and the ink is managed extern external to the print head um, thermally and pressure wise there has to be a negative pressure at the, um, the nozzle so the ink doesn't fall out so there's negative meniscus pressure but it's available to jetting in the same condition regardless now the advantages there are in things like printing white or heavily pigmented inks so all of that is, um, is, is, is proven in single pass markets. And, and this technology is the technology of choice for difficult fluids. And then the third option is the switched recirculation, where you can have it in the print mode. It's an, it's an end shooter. We'll call it an end shooter. Or in the, at the end of each pass, it recirculates. So you're refreshing the ink. The next thing, and I will skim through this because I'm conscious of time, um, the, the, the next technology is, is a complete change. It's designed for a lower cost of print head, perhaps not as long a life. Um, so we're look, looking at maybe one to two years life for these print heads. Whereas the bulk piezo, the, we have print heads in the market that are actually six or seven years old. Um, and uh, we've had reports that most of the failures are actually from events rather than um, uh, all weaknesses in, in, in manufacturer uh, that are covered by warranty, but um, events where there's a, 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 a strike with a substrate. But thin film piezo is rather different. It uses much less material. It's much more um, cost effective to make in high volume. It's a different technology, um, but it can actually break inkjet into new areas of industrial print, where previously the, the capital cost of equipment or the speed of the equipment isn't sufficient. 
Now, looking at this, it, the first products will be water compatible. They'll also, um, it, of course, then uh, UV as well. The productivity, 100 kilohertz um, for firing. It, we tested it to 160 kilohertz, but we're talking that that's an order of magnitude different from the current technologies. We're looking at something in the region of uh, between 10 and 20 kilohertz, let's say. So in some cases, for simple print heads, um, you can get up to 40 or 50 kilohertz in, in some machines, but they are very simple print heads. This is a print head that, that can be up to 1200 dpi and print at 100 plus kilohertz. So we're looking at at least double, probably 500% the speed of current technologies. Um, low cost of operation, um, it's a silicon MEMS body with a thin film piezo actuator. That's a definitely different. Whereas we machine panels in the, pie, uh, the, the piezoelectric material in the PZT, this is actually deposited onto a silicon MEMS frame. On the left, you see the current technologies. Uh, you see that the, the, the brown is actually, or orange, is, is actually the, the PZT material. Uh, and um, on the right, you see a blown up version at the top of the P4, is what we call it, it's platform 4, which is the thin film technology. Now, you can just about see the brown on the top roof of those chambers. Um, that's just a really tiny amount of lead zirconium titanate, just there. Um, the nozzles are effectively around about the same size. They're slightly smaller, but you see the scale on the on the right of the, the, the line of nozzles and line of chambers on the bottom compared to what we have today. So the device is going to come become very much smaller um, and, and very much more difficult to make. So the investment that we need to make is in the technology to manufacture those, which is what we're uh, gearing for, gearing up for now. The technology is proven, and that's that's coming. Um, we, we, we will start that technology in around about 2016. So, it'll, as I said, we deal with OEMs and that will take some time to come through, um, through the OEMs into products. They've got to design machines to be able, be able to use that. So, in summary, ZAR started in wide format graf graphics. Um, it's, it began 15, 20 years ago. Um, we're still in wide format graphics, but other sectors have taken off to a greater extent. So, our presence in wide format graphics and what we're reported to be is is, is less important in wide format graphics and more important in other sectors. Now, I would say that our, our objectives are to become as important as we were before in wide format graphics by rolling in some of the technologies that we've used in other sectors in dirty, harsh, difficult environments to create maximum uptime in the 90% where, so that printing is possible as a continuous, relentless process. Um, some of the industry conversions that we're working on are well advanced and mature so that we've actually revolutionized the market. For example, ceramics, we have a 75% market share and something like 70% uh, uh, of the output from ceramics production is digitally printed. So that's a revolution. Others uh, are in their infancy and yet to show. Some are in the middle. Um, I gave a few examples there with decorative boards, furniture board, floor boards, laminate flooring. Um, there, are, there are other examples I could have used. Uh, I, mean, I, think, I think we'll see over, over, the, over a few years there's going to be a difference in packaging as well. So the success in meeting these requirements, those industrial requirements, has, has given us technologies that we can make, make available to wide format graphics OEMs. And that's what we're in the phase of now. We're launching the 501 product now. And um, I would expect that uh, from July, August, September onwards, there will be products available. Um, so, I mean, if, if, there's, if, if this is all very theoretical um, and uh, it is an insight into technology, I can only talk about ZAR's technology, but there are other print head manufacturers, uh, some of which use some of our technology, some of which don't. Um, so, I, I, I mean, it's just an insight into our little world, um, and I hope that's useful, but I hope it becomes practically useful for, 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 for many of you um, over, over coming years. So that's all from me. Um, if you need more information, we are uh, we take our, because we come from an educa education background. We came came from the university, and part of our role is to actually educate about technology and how it can be used. We do produce uh, and publish guides. They are guides that don't they're not there to sell us. They're there to explain technology. Um, they're available. If you'd like so, one of those guides, um, then please ask for it through DigiPrint. Um, DigiPrint suppliers will be happy to to take your inquiries and requests and they'll pass them through to us and then we'll supply those as quickly as we can. 
depending on the number that are requested. So, so that's all from me. Thank you for your time and thanks for listening. Sorry it ran over time. Um, if there are any questions, I think we have a, a sort of chat room facility now where um, I, I can try and answer anything. <laughs>